I think that for sure is nice. Well, 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 I think that uh, we are live. Yes, so good morning from the Netherlands. Here it's 11 uh, in the morning and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I'm um, Dr. Gemma Casolino from Cambridge University and Jeremy Mustafari of Data Science, and I will be the session chair for this incredible session about machine learning with and for software engineering part two. So today we have uh, very nice papers about, of course, machine learning, five of them, and all the presenters are here, and I think that this session will be very funny. So um, how it how it will work the session. So we have five papers. So the first 25 minutes uh, will be dedicated to the presentation of our presenters. And then we will have a broad discussion all together. But please, also during the presentation, consider to start writing your question in the chat. Or also, when we will start the discussion, consider to just unmute yourself. This year, Midspace is really interactive. So we need to, you know, keep this opportunity. So, okay, so let's start with the first paper. So uh, Nadia will present uh, the first paper and it's about lesser learn on reproducibility machine learning based Android malware detection. So please, Nadia, the stage is yours. Thank you. Okay. I think so. Yes, yes. Thank you. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm Nadia Daudi, a doctoral researcher at SMT at the University of Luxembourg. And today I will present our paper, uh, Lessons Learned on Reproducibility in Machine Learning Based in Void Malware Detection. Uh, this work has been conducted together with uh, Dr. Kevin Alex, Professor Tegavin Divisionde, and Professor Jacqueline. So as you know, Android is very popular among mobile users since it has maintained the highest market share over the last 10 years. But Android is also a victim of its own success since attackers target Android to spread their malicious applications. To tackle the spread of Android malware, uh, many approaches have been proposed in the literature uh, leveraging machine learning techniques. Uh, but malware still finds its way to mobile users in our work, we aim to uh, assess published work to see why malware is still spreading despite the massive work published in the literature. And in this paper, we thoroughly assess the reproducibility of published work, uh, since the reproducibility is an important criteria uh, to, uh, for acknowledging a research contribution. So in our paper, we conduct a reproduction study, which means that we are a different team that tries to use the same, uh, to use the same experimental setup of original approaches. And uh, here I want to mention that uh, this work should not be seen in, uh, as a criticism of the uh, reproduced approaches. Uh, actually being selected in our study uh, means that these approaches already care about open science. Uh, since they make some or uh, part, of, part of their artifacts uh, publicly available. <coughs> to conduct a reproduction study, we need to collect the data set, extract the features, embed them in vectors, and then train the machine learning algorithm for the classification. How we have selected our production subjects? So we have considered 16 major venues in software engineering, security, and machine learning, and papers that have been published between 2009 and 2019. And after applying our selection criterion, uh, we have ended up with five papers that satisfied the minimum criteria for their production attempt. These papers are uh, Driven, Mamadroid, Rivendroid, Droidka, and Masson. So uh, our study has showed that only one out of five approaches can be reproduced. Actually, the time doesn't allow to go through all the problems we have faced during our production study. So it's not about executing the code and writing down the results. It involves collecting data sets from different sources, which can be really challenging. And uh, even when the code is provided, it needs to be reviewed, completed, debugged, and sometimes even corrected. And uh, that involves a massive guesswork and code rework. 
Also, our study has uh, raised the problem of uh, the absence of a systematic method for deciding about the success or failure of your production study. And uh, also, uh, when an approach is not reproducible, um, it cannot undergo a refutability check. So, to conclude, in our paper, we describe our production journey of five approaches on machine learning based in droid malware detection. And uh, with this work, we uh, hope that we all learn uh, lessons from uh, our production study and uh, invest more in making our uh, work reproducible. Thank you. Thanks, Nadia, for, for your presentation. Uh, so now we can move to the, uh, to the second presentation. I want to remember that we will have later the discussion with, with the question. So uh, let's move to the second paper, and in particular, Marita Saha will present um, her paper about money root cause knowledge from cloud service incident investigation for AI ops. So uh, please, Amrita. Uh, Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll be presenting our work on mining root cause knowledge from cloud service incident investigations for AI ops, which is a work done in Salesforce Research Asia. The incident uh, root cause analysis life cycle follows like this. We first do incident detection and then through various analysis, we do symptom detection, followed by uh, investigation by the site reliability team, which triages the incident and finds an immediate re resolution and then a RC investigation by service owners to find the root cause. This entire process is documented in long unstructured documents known as PRBs or problem review board data, which you see in the, on the right hand side. And this is a generic source of rich RC information, which is available in all incident management systems. So the main research question in our work was, can AI is, uh, assist ongoing incident analysis based on the past in, uh, in investigation data in the PRBs? We achieved to do this by extracting and mining relevant RCA information from the PRB data and reusing this knowledge to quickly resolve repeating incidents. So our primary contribution was uh, to build this incident causation analysis uh, engine, which we call ICA, over this PRB data, and it consists of first a neural information extraction system to extract uh, RCA information from the unstructured PRBs. Second, a neural knowledge mining to aggregate incident information into a causal knowledge graph. And then we use ICA for neural incident search over PRB repository to find similar past incidents and do a retrieval based root cause analysis to detect likely root causes and resolutions given an incident symptom. So the incident causation analysis uh, pipeline goes as this. We start with the unstructured PRB documents. We do very high level uh, structure parsing, which uh, uh, gives the subject, the investigation uh, uh, details, and then the RCA details in terms of what was the immediate resolution and root cause. And then we have a in, uh, neural information extraction module based on pre-trained language models like BERT and others. And it does various things. One is like key topic extraction, in summary extraction, symptom and root cause resolution ex uh, extraction. And all of the extracted information along with the original unstructured document is now um, put into a neural search index. It's based on Roberta based embeddings of these uh, documents. And this serves the neural incident search. So now given a query like high latency, high pod CPU, we can now give out the uh, search results in form of structured PRB documents where each PRB has the extracted symptoms, the key topics, summary, root cause, and the resolutions in, uh, in form of short topics. We also have another module uh, called the neural knowledge mining, which takes the extracted information and builds a causal knowledge graph out of it. So with this causal knowledge graph and the neural incident search, we can together serve something called retrieval based root cause analysis. So what it does is given a query symptom like uh, high latency, high pod CPU, it can now suggest what are the possible resolutions or what are the possible root causes and also show the part of the query causal knowledge subgraph which is relevant to the given query. So for example, for this query like high latency, high pod CPU, it detected that 
customer induced sql execution load is one of the possible root causes so one of the main challenges of this was ICA, uh, all of the components of ICA were unsupervised. We didn't have any particular uh, supervision of the kind of extraction and information extraction or the root cause analysis. So we did this kind of evaluation where uh, for different modules, we have different types of evaluation. For the neural information extraction, we did human evaluation of around 300 to 1200 instances. And we showed that around 80 to 95% of the extracted topics and summaries were really well formed and informative and also 70 to 80 percent of the extracted root causes and resolutions actually match the expert human annotations then for the neural incident search we did a, quant a quantitative benchmarking over 2000 prb records coming from real incidents happening in salesforce and uh, we uh, saw that the average overlap between the target and the top 10 retrieved PRB documents is around 30 to 35 blue points, where blue is uh, the standard text similarity metric. And we even achieved 2 to 3% improvement over the traditional non-neural search. And for the retrieval-based RCA, if we use the neural incident search engine alone, then the root cause and resolution prediction given the symptom achieves a blue score of 29 between the true and the predicted one. And if you further use the causal knowledge graph on top of this incident search results, we can further improve the root cause and resolution prediction by further uh, 11 to 15 points. And uh, we also did a um, uh, inspection of 50 real incidents post deployment of our ICA in Salesforce. And we saw that 56% of them had at least one of the top three predicted root causes, which matched the true root cause detected by the uh, site reliability team who were actually investigating the incidents. So this is the highlights of uh, our work. And thank you. Thank you, Amrita, for your presentation. So let's move to the third paper presentation. And so in particular, Dan Susan uh, will present the paper that is about improving machine translation system via isotopic replacement. So please, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jason from Peking University, and this is our paper, Improving Machine Translation Systems via Isotopic Replacement. Machine translation is able to translate between thousands of pairs of languages effectively in real time. The tools such as Google Translate and Bing Translator are widely used in people's daily life. Such machine translation systems are not perfect, and the bugs the user's experience have a different character from those um, traditional non-machine learning based software systems. Um, recently, quite a few approaches have been proposed for testing machine translation systems. To test this system, a promising trend among those approaches is to use word replacement. For example, given the sentence, women do good research in computer science, a testing approach transfer can generate an input sentence by replacing the word woman with a similar word man. Uh, this input is further paired with the original sentence as test input. Then the testing approach fits those two sentences to the machine translation. Since there is only one word is changed in those sentences, their translations are to be similar to each other. In this example, there should be only uh, one word differences between those two translations. However, if the translations are not similar to each other, the testing approach reports it at a, as an inconsistency bug. Those, uh, those approaches are good. However, precise control of the impact of word replacement is in those word replacement based approaches is still difficult due to the fuzzy semantics of new natural language words. For example, the word great in this sentence is not suitable to be replaced by the word good. To tackle this difficulty, we propose a novel word replacement based approach called CAT to machine translation testing. Giving a sentence in the thought 
In the source language, cat performs as topic replacement to generate new sentences. And the goal of the as topic replacement is to control the impact of the word replacement. To realize this as topic replacement, we first conduct context aware word replacement, which replaces a word within a sentence with another word that is also suitable for the context. Then we calculate the context aware sem uh, semantic similarity between the original word and the replaced word, use the similar and use this similarity to discard the word and replace the word replacement that influences the semantics. Following a testing and a repair approach, trans repair cat can also test and further repair the inconsistency box. And uh, this and this is the overview of our approach. Uh, in this paper, we focus on four research questions on the effectiveness of test input generation, bug detection, bug repair, and uh, the efficiency. We conducted experiments on two machine learning translators, Transformer and Google Translate. Since CAT follows TransPair, we select TransPair as the baseline. For the effectiveness of test generation for each sentence, uh, in our data set, we generate test input with CAT and the transfer, and we, we found that CAT gener generates nearly 10,000 test input, while our transfer only generates 5,000 test input. For bug detection, CAT detects 129% more bugs than transfer. And for bug repair, CAT repairs twice more bugs than transfer. For efficiency, CAT is uh, significantly more efficient than transpire in mutant generation and bug detection, and has a comparable efficiency with transpire in bug repair. Um, to conclude, we propose CAT uh, as a topic replacement based approach to improving machine translation. And the, the experimental results on Google Translate and the Transformers show that CAT performs better than transpire. Yeah, that's all. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Dr. Tan, for, for your presentation. So uh, now we will move to the uh, fourth paper, so the first presentation um, given uh, uh, by Hong Kang. Uh, so he will talk about, about the technique source alarm from automatic stasis analysis tools. How far are we? Let, let's, let's see the answer. Right. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. So now I'll talk about our work. And the context of our work are the warnings produced by static analyzers, such as fine bugs. Because there are no guarantees that the warnings produced from these tools are real bugs, warnings could either be actionable warnings or could be false alarms. One line of research has aimed to put a machine learning classifier in between the warnings and the developers. If the classifier predicts that a warning is a false alarm, then it is not presented to the developer. And by doing so, this would save a developer a lot of time and effort. So in the literature, many different features have been proposed and a, a, a prior work identified the most important features out of over 100 features from the literature. And these features are known as the, the golden features. And then subsequently, another, another group of researchers found that the use of the golden features would achieve up to 99.5% AUC. So to construct such a data, a, a, the data sets for an experiment, we would need a training data set and a testing data set. So to obtain training data, we could identify one revision of a, of a project as a training revision in which warnings would be collected from. So we would collect warnings, compute the features, and obtain the labels for each warning. And then we, we, this is the training data set that a classifier can be trained with. And after training a classifier, we could then repeat the same procedure to obtain a, a data set that, that is used for testing the classifier. So to determine the ground truth label of a warning, Prior work proposed the use of a heuristic that essentially compares the warnings at a given revision, say the training revision, against the warnings at the reference revision. An open warning refers to a warning that is present at a, at a given revision and is, and is still present at the reference revision. And a closed warning refers to a warning that was, that was present at a training revision, but is no longer present at the reference revision, even though the source file is still present. Prior work assumes that open warnings are false alarms and closed warnings are actionable warnings. So one interesting class of features among the golden features are the warning context features. 
This feature essentially captures the proportion of action actionable warnings within a given context, such as a method or a file. So the intuition here is that if developers have historically fixed warnings related to a given method, then if in the future, if we see warnings related to this method, then developers may be more likely to fix these warnings. However, in our analysis of the, the data, we find that there's an issue of data leakage when computing the proportion of actionable warnings. To determine the proportion of actionable warnings, we will need to know the, uh, the, the number of, of actionable warnings within the context. And to determine if a, a warning is actionable, we, the, it is, uh, uh, we would do so by comparing against the reference revision. So if a warning was reported at a given revision and it's no longer reported at the reference revision, then the warning is determined to be actionable. So this introduces a problem because this was the same procedure that was used to determine the ground truth label of the warning. And this leaks the ground truth label into the features. And so this is unrealistic because in order to compute these features, we would need to know the status of the warnings in the future. And this information would not be available if we were to use this tool in practice. So we also find issues of data duplication. And then after we address the issues and re-implementing the warning context features, we find that F1 drops from 0.88 to 0.38. So in other words, we see that the, the strong experimental results stem from very subtle issues of data leakage and data duplication. So these issues were hard to detect, but they have a significant impact. Next, we also analyze the heuristic used to determine the, the ground truth labels. So the heuristic assumes that closed warnings are actionable. However, after we two of the authors of the paper manually annotated the closed warnings, we find that many warn closed warnings were not, uh, were not necessarily actionable, and many of them were only closed incidentally. So in other words, the code was closed, but the, the, the code was changed for reasons that were unrelated to the warning. And therefore, we, we were unable to determine if the warning was actionable. Uh, our work was a triumph of open science. We built very heavily upon the, the data and the scripts that were made of the packages of the prior papers. So uh, in our experiments on the golden features, we find that they suffered from subtle issues, but had a significant impact. But we want to note that the golden features are still predictive. In our experiments, they had an AUC greater than 0 0.5. And we also want to stress that our work does not show that this line of work is impractical or impossible. In our work, we use only very simple classifiers, such as SVMs and k nearest neighbors classifiers. So our, our work motivates the need for more work and analysis. And in, our, and, and in our analysis of the heuristic, we find that while it enables the generation of a large data set, the labels that are derived through the heuristic do not agree with human oracles. So this, this implies that in future, we need to have more manually labeled data, or we need to use methods that could address the lack of labeled data if labeling data is too expensive. So that's all from me, and I'm happy to discuss this, this work further. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation. Very nice work. And now, now let's move to the last presentation of the session given by Manny Shetty. Uh, and he will talk about deep analyze, learning to localize crashes at scale. Uh, hey, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, uh, today uh, I'm Manish and today I'll be talking about uh, deep analyze, learning to localize crashes at scale. This is work done jointly with my colleagues at uh, Microsoft Research. To uh, start with some context, today when systems crash around the world, Microsoft collects crash dumps for root cause analysis and bug fixing uh, back at Microsoft. And we, could have, we would have seen this in our systems when uh, Windows tries to you know, send a crash dump back to Microsoft. A key component of uh, analysis that helps, that helps with this analysis back at Microsoft is a debugger extension called Bang Analyze, which was introduced to the research community in an SOSP uh, paper from 2009. So this debugger extension has been built and maintained for over 20 plus years and performs various kinds of automated analysis of crash dumps. Uh, such as finding the blame frame, finding the issue in the stack, and so on. So, but despite its success for you know two decades, there are still some challenges, and that we're seeing today. First thing is that the code base has become um, uh, old and obviously monolithic, and and it's become hard to ma maintain. It's in the order of hundreds of thousands of lines, and it relies on um, hundreds of heuristics 
to analyze these different crash tags. And newer applications that are coming up uh, uh, every day require some amount of custom plugins and heuristics to be written, uh, rewritten again and again. For, and, and they take months to deploy uh, these code changes. So the question that we're trying to answer uh, in this work is, can we augment bang analyze with data-driven approaches, which can solve some of these problems? So in this work, we try to answer that question by proposing deep analyze, uh, where we leverage recent advances in deep learning and natural language processing to build a data-driven system. Specifically, we uh, aim to predict the blame frame in a crash tag, where, where, where I define blame frame as the frame that most likely caused the crash. And thus, finding this blame frame can lead us to the root cause. So hence, like to, uh, to be more specific, this particular task is quite central to the problem of uh, crash tip analysis. Specifically, uh, deep analyze has particular goals. Uh, we want to move away from manually written rules, as, as I said. And we want to enable this kind of analysis for newer applications and scenarios with very minimal effort and uh, you know with very minimal label data as well. So our approach begins with first a large scale study of crashes where we analyze 362,000 crashes. And we gather some insights from this empirical analysis to guide the design of our system. Then we develop and implement deep analyze and evaluate it in, uh, on real world crashes. So to briefly go over our empirical analysis, uh, like I said, we analyzed 362,000 crashes from various sources. We looked at multiple properties of crashes. For example, we looked at crash locations, that is the location in the stack where the blame frame was found. And we see that in 33% of the cases, they are deeper than the top frame, hence making it harder to identify. Next, we find that no single binary or application accounts for majority of the crashes. Therefore, any kind of application-specific heuristics or methods would not scale and solve our problem. And uh, in the interest of time, I will go to the last insight, which is where we looked at how frequently a method is blamed uh, uh, to, in crashes. And, and we compute a custom metric called blame ratio, which is the ratio of the number of stacks where a method is blamed to the ratio of stacks containing that method. And what you see here is a plot of blame ratio. We find that significant fra fraction of methods have a blame ratio less than one, which indicates that a method which is blamed in one stack need not always be blamed in another. And that particular decision of whether to blame or not blame a method completely depends on the context it appears in. And that context here is the other methods in the stack, which are above and below it. And I refer you to the paper for uh, much more insights and, and details from an empirical study. Um, based on these insights, we then also take some inspiration from natural language processing to formulate the problem of blame frame prediction as a sequence prediction task. So we basically uh, perform sequence labeling on a stack. So for more intuition on the design and, and why we choose this for particular formulation, again, please refer to the paper. Uh, we then use uh, a standard BiLSTM CRF based model for, our, for this sequence labeling uh, task. To further improve performance on top of this BiLSTM CRF, we use a novel uh, multitask learning procedure where we train the model to predict not just the blame frame, but also the high level symptom of the crash. For example, was it a stack overflow problem? Was it zero division? Was it a null pointer error? And so on. And learning these two tasks jointly enables uh, you know, us to improve our performance as well as generalization of the model um, a lot. To evaluate deep analyze, we then compare against multiple heuristics as well as machine learning based baselines. And we do this comparison against uh, four different applications which are quite popular from Microsoft, Edge, Excel, Word, and Outlook. And we take crashes from each of these applications train our models on, on a section of the data and, uh, and test our models on data that occurs after it in a, in a time in a timeline. Hence, we don't have any overlap between uh, in terms of the history of the data. So we observe that although these baselines uh, are quite strong, Deep Analyze still combines context and complementary information 
using this novel multitask learning procedure and outperforms all of these baselines with an average accuracy of 90%. But the question that remains is, how do we scale this to new applications and platforms? Does this mean that I have to train a new deep analyzed model for every single application? And, and would that be uh, efficient to do so? To answer that question, we propose a transfer learning approach. Here uh, in our empirical analysis, we found that models trained on one set of applications can be transferred to a disjoint set of applications. And we'd evaluate this hypothesis in this experiment, which we call cross-app crash localization. Here, we evaluate this by training a, a deep analyzed model, which we call the global model, on a global set of crashes from, let's say, X set of applications. Then we evaluate it on crashes from a completely unseen application, say, Edge. We find that the global model is able to predict 80% of these unseen crashes without seeing a single edge crash during training. Moreover, we can further fine tune that uh, the global model to this particular application and reach, let's say, 90% accuracy with just 2000 crash, crash examples. So this not only creates a very scalable solution for transferring models from uh, a global set to new applications with very minimal labeled data, and also reach high accuracies, but it also provides more than 10x reductions in training cost during uh, uh, when compared to like training from scratch. So to summarize, uh, we developed deep analyze using the recent advances in machine learning and NLP for crash localization. We propose a multitask learning model for blame frame prediction and show an effective transfer learning and fine tuning approach for cross application crash localization. We plan to expand to cross-platform crash localization, where we try to transfer models from Windows crashes to Linux crashes. And we also want to extend these models to other tasks that Bang Analyze perform performs today, such as fault localization and bucketization at the thread level. Thank you. Thanks, Nish, for your presentation. Uh, so I think that I mean, I invite all the presenters to unmute themselves and, you know, also um, turn on the webcam because I think that now we enter in, you know, in the cool part, the coolest part of the session, and we will start with some questions for the author. So I will first, um, you know, check in the chat. And I noticed that the first question is for Nadia, in particular. Um, so, Kushal, uh, Nadia, what are what are your recommendations to improve uh, reproducibility in malware detection? Yes, thank you for this question. So, uh, from my experience, I would <coughs> sorry, I would say that uh, which we we need to keep track and uh, document our experiments. Uh, document how uh, we have collected our data sets even that like seems to be simple but sometimes we collect data sets from different sources from Onroso, from different markets but at the end we uh, like we don't really uh, remember uh, the sources so we need to keep track of all of this and um also clean the repository because uh, some uh, approaches i uh, try to uh, reproduce like the release uh, thousands of scripts so at the end, you don't really know which one has been uh, really used in the experiments, and you, 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 you like you, uh, you are in the situation that you need to guess which script. So that's problem problematic. And um, also, like uh, some machine learning experiments, they require a seed control the r randomness of the results. So if we can also fix these seeds and uh, keep track of them, that would uh, that would be really helpful. So that's it. Thanks, Nadia, for your answer. Uh, there is another answer, uh, uh, question, sorry, for Zehu. So I, I read it. So um, uh, Zensu San has a question on uh, uh, semantic evaluation, semantic evaluation to generated test inputs. How do you evaluate the effectiveness of its similarity metrics? Yeah, thanks for the question. And uh, um, we computed the semantic evaluation with effort and uh, um, 
uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of this cement uh, similarity metric. Uh, in the experiment, we use the human evaluation to check the effectiveness of it. Thank you. Thank you for for the answer. Uh, then we have uh, a question for Hong. So thank you for the great talk. You mentioned find bugs to generate the initial static analysis alarm, I believe. This is not a very precise static analyzer to start with. Can you comment on the impact of the precision of static analysis tools on alarm filtering approaches? Yeah, thanks for the good question. So you're right that the experiments we worked on mainly were, uh, it, uh, it was used in the prior work and in the, in the prior work, they used fine bugs to generate the wall links. So fine bugs is a very old tool and it's likely that you, using newer tools would give you a lot more performance improvements. So, but uh, most of the features considered in the literature, they capture a different aspect of the, of the problem. So one, one particular class of, of, uh, uh, of features, are the, are the, they, kept, uh, they capture the process metrics. So these things would be orthogonal to the, to the code. Where, so while static analysis tools consider the code, the, a lot of these features, they consider things like the processors and the developers. So the, it's very likely that this, this alarm filtering approaches would still uh, improve on the precision on of the static analysis tools. So Thanks. I wonder if that answers your questions. Yeah. I I think yes. Maybe I don't know if the if who uh you know wrote the que wrote the question on the chat. Maybe he can he can also unmute himself and uh, you know say yes or no. So by the way, we will go. Um, We'll go on with a question. Oh, okay, yeah, I. That's... I just wanted to say yes. Thank you for uh, thank you for the answer. Thank you, thank you for your question. Yeah, and so um, I... thank you for the work. Sorry, thank you for the work and identifying limitations. Um, just just to let you know, I work at Oracle Labs, and yeah, we we tried several tools from academia, and we could almost never reproduce the stellar results that are presented in, in many papers. So it's great to see that some people are actually drilling down and finding the root causes of why things don't work in practice right. so often. So thanks for that. Right. Thanks. Yes, indeed it's true. It's, uh, I think that uh, this paper, and that's now, I mean, it's clear, uh, understand why it's, um, has been nominated for uh, this paper award. I think that you know um, it's clear that also if you present something that you know um, in a way wants to focus attention on something that is negative in a way because of course the the value of F measure tremendously degrees. Uh, this means that we can do also good science, not only presenting, you know, every summer result and say, hey, everything is fine. We propose a very cool approach, so uh, we are the best. So really, yeah, it's true. I, I agree. Uh, okay, so uh, we have another question for uh, Zayu. So yeah. do these metrics relate to the length? Uh, so I'm curious about your sentences uh, about similarity metrics. Do these metrics relate to the length of sentences? If so, will small disturbation on stored sentences influence similarity severely? Yes, this is a good question. Thank you. And uh, uh, the uh, similarity is computed by BERT, and uh, I, I don't think it's. Uh, it is related to. I don't think it is related to the nouns of the sentence. Since I, uh, uh, I don't, I don't do the experiment, but I checked many examples generated by the uh, word replacement and the, the S topic replacement, and, and I think uh, the the nouns of the sentence is not the uh, one of the uh, will not influence the similarity. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks for, for your answer. So there is a question for Amrita. Uh, so um, I, think, I think the quality of incident reports is an important factor for natural language processing techniques to work well. Do you have any suggestion for engineers about how to write high quality incident? Thanks, really good question. 
Yes, yes, it's a really important factor. Um, and indeed, uh, the NLP techniques won't work un unless the quality of the incident reports are, uh, are high quality. So um, one of the things which we saw in real incident analysis, it uh, goes on for a few days. There are various different phases uh, in it. The incident investigation followed by the uh, root cause analysis is done by different teams. So many of the times the documents are really uh, were quite unstructured. They have email discussions within them, uh, cross team communications or uh, other uh, sources uh, from which um, the information is coming. So one thing, uh, one of the main um, points where this uh, this kind of unstructured documents are required is uh, finding out what what was the real root cause because they will often uh, discuss what are the possible root causes and then uh, maybe they'll indicate to what was the final. Thing which solves the problem. So uh, it would really be helpful if these uh, uh, this process of documenting had some way to kind of uh, pinpoint which was the final root cause or which was the final uh, way of uh, resolving the problem. So even in Salesforce, we are trying to develop uh, the uh, process of documenting these investigations better. Uh, by structuring the whole process. But given it's a very agile uh, environment, maybe we won't be able to completely rely on uh, human, uh, uh, um, like human structuring the uh, documents well enough because it's a very uh, long run uh, process uh, involving multiple teams. And also the kinds of uh, incidents also change over time. So that's why we probably need a combination of uh, this, like some unstructured data where NLP can be helpful, but at least if the information content has the final root cause, uh, we have seen that NLP and some of the uh, recent pre-trained models are very good at extracting the right uh, information from the long documents. So thanks, Amrita, for your answer. So I do not see any questions on, on the chat. I don't know if someone wants simply to unmute him or herself to uh, ask something to the other otherwise. Uh, yeah, I have, I have actually a question for, for Manish. Um, I really enjoyed to the, your presentation. I, I think that's it's really nice work. And I'm wondering whether you, um, um, so, you you uh, say that you uh, perform these uh, uh, very large analysis of, of crashes, and uh, you in a way manually uh, you know investigate on them. So how was the process? Can you argue more more on that? And after that, did you find, for example, that for some particular type of crashes, um, some particular crashes uh, are more familiar? Uh, to a particular system in Microsoft based on the domain of, of, of the system. I mean, Excel and Outlook are, you know, came from Microsoft, but they are different. They belong in different domain. So. Yeah, great questions. And thank you. Thank, thanks for the question. So, um, so first thing about the empirical analysis. So what we what we do in in our analysis is basically collect the crashes and that are labeled by bang analyze itself and by again to reiterate what bang analyze is is a 20 year old tool and mm -hmm. and so like the heuristics are quite like it's quite it's quite verified and and, and everything is written by over the 20 or 20 plus years so so we in that sense we trust the the, the system quite well in terms of accuracy it's a problem that we're trying to solve here. It's the scale problem, because today we can't keep writing this these sets of rules and and so on for new applications. And that's what that's the main core of the paper. So in terms of accuracy, we believe in bang analyze, and and that's where we get all the labels from. And the process basically goes like we take the uh, labeled examples from bang analyze, and then we'd have different kinds of research questions. In the sense, we want to understand. Uh, can we like can we try to memorize blame frames right if we could just memorize blame frame then we could just have a dictionary of blame frames and, mm. and just see if it exists in the crash and then and then do that but that we find that that's not the case because like i said one in one crash a blame a blame method might be 
X, Y, Z, but the same method might not be a, the, the, the blame frame in another. And that completely depends on the call stack. And that call stack basically is the functions that, that are calling it as well as what, what it's calling. So the callee and caller relationships. So it's very important for our, whatever tool we build to actually capture that context. And that's what we kind of figured out from our empirical analysis. And uh, yeah, and there are multiple other kinds of research questions where we try to understand uh, what kinds of software components are crashing. For instance, we find uh, operating systems also crash um, and, and drivers are, are one very common thing. Yeah. And also, it's, it's really interesting to do also this kind of analysis based on the domain of software. Because, of course, these, I mean, especially in, in, in Microsoft context, you can, you can allocate resources in a, in, in a way better if, you know, I mean, if some types of crashes, uh, you know, uh, appears more in, uh, in the domain of the application, like, uh, you know, office package in a way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And and to just add to what you said, it, that's exactly what happened. So if we can do this kind of prediction very accurately, what we can do is bucketize these crashes. So we can just prioritize our efforts on, on those crashes, yeah. which are very frequent and so on. Uh, and to just briefly answer your second question, I think uh, I kind of forgot what you asked. Uh, uh, could you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, w I was about really, I mean, uh, uh, if you find, you know, um some interesting results based on the you know based on the system that you analyze since are are different in terms of domain i mean i'm not yeah. talking about excel or microsoft or of uh, word but for example outlook it's you know kind of different in terms of domain right so uh, the, the 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 hypothesis that we come, came up with that you can actually transfer models from one application to another it depends not actually on the methods of the application itself. It's the other methods in the stack. So if you see a stack, um, there's like, let's say 30% or like, like 50% of it is application, but there's actually a lot of underlying methods which are just common across applications, which is just your system, your, your Windows device manager, your device managers or your desktop managers. And all these are kind of common across application, irrespective of whether it's Outlook, Edge, whatever it is. Yeah. There's also other kinds of patterns which you can see. For example, uh, you can have a Stack Overflow issue in Excel or in Outlook. And that issue will actually create patterns of repeating frames in a stack. That pattern you can learn either from Excel or Outlook, and that's what we want to do. So there are some common and generic patterns which you can just learn irrespective of the application. Thanks, thanks, Manish, for for your answer. Um, yeah, so we we have a question for you again. So, um, any reason behind choosing LSTM based architecture instead of transformed base? Uh, good question. Uh, thanks, Amrita. And yeah, the the reason is mostly in terms of like efficiency and. Uh, it's it's more just it's it's much more faster for us to deploy even if we have to create multiple models uh, and also train uh, and the other reason is that uh, we have multiple layers not just the LSTM in our architecture which is for example the CRF layer and things like that uh, we found in our experiments that we found we found that th there are certain layers which just work very well with the LSTM layer and 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 it's basically just a design decision there. And that's pretty much. And we're also just trying to keep the model as simple as possible. That's, that's it. Yeah, thanks for the answer. Yeah. No OK, I don't see any other question in the chat. Actually, I have a question for Nadia. Uh, so you know, you talk about, uh, you know, uh, about a problem, about, you know, um, re, uh, the fact about replication that, you know, uh, that an approach is uh, reproducible and so on. Uh, you know, uh, during your presentation, uh, I, uh, I thought that, you know, in a way, this was a cultural problem. Because now, I mean, if, if you see in the conference, now we see that uh, uh, the research community now pay attention to replication, you know, because there are uh, artifact evaluation track. Uh, in general, now in the call for paper, um, program chair write that they want paper that in a way can be 
you know, reproduce and, uh, and can be replicated in a way. So I'm wondering uh, if uh, uh, when you did your analysis, uh, uh, so when you compare different kinds of uh, uh, malware detection approach, did you find, for example, that the latest approach were more uh, replicable in a way compared to the oldest one? This is my uh, first question. And then my second question was, um, is, so uh, do you agree with my, you know, with my talk about it's a cultural problem that we have in our research community that now is changing? So now we are more, we forced people, we force people to please share your data, share your science with all the community. I totally agree with you. You are right. Actually, um, uh, like re recently, I noticed that uh, the community is paying more attention to the reproducibility and uh, <clears throat> especially with like the uh, artifact evaluation tracks and uh, all these um, uh, initiatives. And um, like I, in, my, in my study, I uh, attempted to reproduce uh, f five approaches uh, for ma for Android malware uh, detection, and uh, indeed the the latest approach, which has been published in 2019 at IEC, it was reproducible. Uh, like uh, it was really clean. The data set was really documented. The, the, the scripts and the, all like uh, I really faced no issues uh, reproducing this uh, this approach. So yes, the the problem seems to be like uh, um, to be to, to to be started to like uh, to, to be solved. That's very good. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other question on the chat. I don't know if someone wants to unmute him or herself. Otherwise, uh, I have a question for Amrita. Uh, so also based on the question that you receive in the chat, it seems that, uh, you know, um, we can apply artificial intelligence to um, derive possible root case of, uh, of incident report. But according also to your discussion and your presentation, it seems really uh, you know, a subjective problem because a uh, team uh, can perform different type of incident report. I mean, the structure can be the same, but you know, it's a really tricky problem. So what do you think about and I mean, uh, uh, which are the next steps also after the work that you presented? Uh, yes, that, you so, know, we, we, sorry, do you think that we need, we need to go and continue, you know, using machine learning, artificial uh, neural network uh, in uh, artificial intelligence, or maybe we need to go uh, in a direction where we need to standardize this kind of, you know, documentation? Yes, uh, it's a very good, good question. So uh, I think uh, we need to do both. Uh, we, uh, given that like the kind of incidents completely change over time and the, the agile process, and it will involve multiple teams discussing and doing this, it's a very iterative kind of process uh, which we are documenting. So maybe completely standardizing it in a way that uh, is consistent throughout uh, is going to be hard. It may not be very practical, but still, like there are efforts ongoing even uh, at Salesforce and in any other uh, place as well uh, to uh, make this process more structured, the, make the documentations easy for the knowledge to be reused. Uh, but at the same time, it may not be uh, possible to directly we use the knowledge from the documentations like this. So we might need to, need to be having some uh, NLP uh, or some AI capability which extracts the information or uh, which uh, uh, uses the information in a way uh, or uh, at least stores the information in a way which can be used by AI models as well as uh, humans. So it needs to be a combination of both of these uh, two things. And there's another uh, thing is uh, why we looked at these in uh, investigation data is that like there's a lot of work on root cause analysis, looking at systems data like logs, traces and um, others, but they don't uh, have the oracle information. like what was the actual root cause uh, for a given incident whereas the prp data has somewhere hidden in those documents uh, what was the root cause in it so we are just trying to make that thing more structured so that 
we can now feed back this information into like something like a multimodal uh, the holistic root cause analysis uh, model, which looks at all the different kinds of system data and has this oracle root cause knowledge from the PRPs. So that would be like our uh, kind of future uh, which you were talking about. Thanks, thanks, Samarita, for uh, for your answer. So we have another question for Manish. So uh, how do you collect the label of data in the transfer learning? Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so like I said, the label data comes from uh, Bang Analyze itself. So like I said, this, this, this is a tool that we believe in, we trust in, and we've been using for a while. So we get that. It's basically almost almost like a week supervised data, but then the supervision is quite very 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 accurate. So we we just use that as the as the ground truth in us in our in our, in our analysis every analysis. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, so actually, I have a question for Hong. Uh, so um, according to your slides, I, I was impressed about the fact that in a way. Uh, developers close, you know, warning accidentally, or, you know, they're really not aware about, you know, the presence of a warning. Uh, so I think that um, it can be really interesting to, you know, uh, understand uh, the perception of developer, maybe using survey or, you know, focus group in order to, I think that reinforce this study that is already really, really good. And uh, uh, so moment um in principle but i, I have an, a question important question how far are we <laughs> the end? so uh well we're, we're not far we're, we're far from solving the problem entirely but there, there's certainly progress that's been made so as i i said in the, in the presentation the features that we used had uh they were predictive they had AUC greater than 0 0.5 so they were not entirely random and we were, we were getting numbers that were generally positive, although it's not as high as the prior work. So uh, another yeah. thing to point out yeah. that I missed out in the presentation was that when we clean up the data, by uh, when we experimented on the manually labeled data, we actually had a slight performance improvement. So it, it does indicate that uh, it's, it's very likely that the performance that we see now, uh, is actually low, it would be lower than what we would, we would have if we had labeled a lot more data or we had some way to deal with the lack of data. So it's likely that we could push the performance using more sophisticated uh, techniques, like newer machine learning models, uh, pre-processing techniques. So we are, uh, I can't exactly <laughs> say how far are we, but there is, there is progress, I think. Yeah, OK, thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think that, OK, I don't see any other question, but actually I have a, also a question common for Zezu San. Uh, so if, if I correctly un understood, uh, uh, you, um, you apply your approach uh, for English and Chinese language, right? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah for example, during your presentation, I, I, um, I told also about, you know, uh, not only uh, about words that were wrongly translated, but also uh, to the fairness on how this kind of work, you know, um, can be can be translated. And for example, in the context of fairness, fairness I think that uh, in Italian, in a, uh, in a way, we, we have the same problem of, of fairness. Um, I mean, do you do you plan in future work to also consider uh, to apply your approach for uh, different languages, but also consider to investigate in uh, in the fairness. Uh, so when we talk about you know uh, translation of, of languages, yeah, um, uh, I think our approach can be applied to many different languages, and uh, we uh, we only do the experiment in English and uh, Chinese, but uh, I think uh, it can be worked on many different languages um, okay okay thank you so thank we you. have uh 30 seconds before uh, 
our session uh, ends. Uh, I hope that you will you enjoy the session. Uh, me too, for, for sure. So I would like to thank again our presenters uh, for today for this session of about machine learning. Uh, so see you uh, around in the mid space area environment and hope you again enjoy the session. So an applause for all the all the speakers <laughs> and presenters here. Yeah. So see you around. Thank you. See you.